Welcome back to the fourth part of this series on creating a Netcat clone in Rust. Last time we looked at streaming data from standard in to standard out using a Tokyo task. This time we're going to take that concept further and use it to copy from standard in to the network and from the network back to standard out. So let's jump into building the client side of that. Let's start by setting up a skeleton function for our client. So we'll have a pub async function called client that returns a result of empty and string errors. And then just to make the compiler happy while we work, we'll return OK empty as our initial value. As the client, we want to be establishing the network connection. So we'll use Tokyo Net TCP stream. This is almost the same class that we used when we did synchronous network connections a couple of videos ago. But this time it's Tokyo's version that can do asynchronous IO. So we can use it the same way we did before, connect, and we'll just hard code the connection for now to localhost 2323. And we can come back around and accept options from the command line later. Wait for the connection to be established and then handle errors if there are any. And bubble that error up. So that's our connection. Give that a variable name. And then for the next part, we want to be able to handle reads and writes from this network connection separately. So we're going to split up this client TCP stream into two parts, the reading part and the writing part. The way we do that is by calling client.intosplit. And that returns two things. So we'll let, and we'll use some new syntax here that splits up the read and the write response from this function. So mut reader, mut writer. So what we're doing here is calling a function that returns a tuple, two values, and we're destructuring that in place. So we're declaring two variables here, one called read, one called write, sorry, one called reader, one called writer. And then we can use those independently to read from and write to the socket. So let's do the write first. So we'll spawn a task on Tokyo, which takes an async function that moves anything you pass to it. So it takes ownership of anything you pass to it. And we'll use the same thing we did with standard IO. We'll use a Tokyo IO uh, copy to read from standard in and write to the writer. So we're copying from standard in to network out. So the writer for our client socket. Await that finishing. So that's our first job. We want a second job that does the network read. So let's set that up as well. So Tokyo spawn again. Again, an async move function. And then we do a copy. And this time I'm going to read from the reader. So we pass the reader first. And then we want to write the standard out. So we'll get a reference to standard out and await that operation. There we go. Now, these on their own don't do anything. We've pushed tasks onto Tokyo, but those tasks have to be executed somehow. To make that happen, we'll assign each of these to a variable so we can consume them. So we'll call this client read, and the second one, client write. And then again, we need to introduce something new. So we're going to use a Tokyo select which looks something like this. And it's a little bit like a match, except that it's dealing with async code. So we're going to pass each of our two handles to this for it to run. So initially this syntax is going to look a little odd and that's because we're only really using a part of it. So the underscore is throwing away a variable. We will be getting a response from each of these uh, jobs if we were going to run them properly, but we don't care about the output. We care about the work that they do. So we're not gonna capture the variable. Then each of these is a task or a future that Tokyo can run. 
and the select will run them in parallel. So both of these tasks will launch and run, and as soon as one of them finishes, Tokyo will cancel the other. So until either the network closes the connection, or we stop writing or reading to standard out, we reach the end of one of those streams, this will keep running and keep doing its job. And then the last bit of syntax is the code to run when one of those completes. But at the moment, we don't have anything we need to do. Just when one of these finishes, we'll stop running our job and let the program shut down. So the main thing to understand is that Tokyo is running both of these tasks at the same time. So both the client read and client write are running at the same time. So let's see if we can watch that doing something against Netcat. Since we've built out the client side first, we're going to need a Netcat server that's listening on the port we're connecting to. So we'll do a Netcat listen to, to make a server. Tell it what port to run on, 2323, because that matches our code, and bind to localhost. So that's listening. And then we can cargo run our project to start up the client. And it's not saying anything, but that's because it's connected and it's waiting for us to do something. So we can type in anything we like here and it comes out on the server. And this time we can go the other way around as well. So we can type in on the server and say, hi back. And that's coming back to our client. So our Tokyo tasks are working really well. Now we can code the server side equivalent of this client function. It's gonna share a lot of the same code. This Tokyo task for reading and writing can be shared and the select can also be shared, but that means we have to deal with lifetimes for the reader and writer when we move them into a separate function. So for now, I don't want to deal with that. So we're just going to go ahead and copy paste this function and we'll worry about cleaning up the code a bit later. So we'll have a server function and that will need a TCP listener instead of a stream. And because that expects multiple connections, we bind to that address to listen to the connections. We'll update the error message and update the variable name. So that will become listener. And then the way that Netcat does this is to listen for multiple connections, one at a time. We're just going to listen for the first one we get, and we'll come back and add in the loop later. So we'll just do listener, accept, and await. So this await means that we will wait for a connection to arrive. So the function will just suspend here, and nothing will happen until we receive a connection. And then we'll uh, map that error if anything went wrong. And we can assign this to be a variable, so call that handle. And we want to bubble that error out. There we go. So there's a slight API difference here. With a standard net TCP listener, we just get back the TCP stream here. But with Tokyo's version, we also get given the socket address. So this is the address of the remote client that's connecting to us. We don't need that right now. So we'll do the same trick as we did just below here, which is to destructure the response. It's a tuple. So we'll get the handle and throw away the remote connection address. We don't care about it. So now our handle is a TCP stream and we can do the same thing that we did with our client TCP stream, which is to split it into a reader and writer, load up two tasks that will do the copy from the network on and off standard and in and out. And then we'll run our select so that we can run both of these tasks. So let's see if that works. So our program is now behaving as a server. So we'll run it and that should start up our TCP listener. So we're not seeing anything here. It's just hanging, but that's okay. That means it's listening for connections. So let's try and connect to that with Netcat. So we'll Netcat to localhost 2323. And again, we don't see anything here, but we should be able to start typing. So we'll type in hello, and that's coming out on our server. And we'll try and respond back with my Rust server. And that's come back to the client. So now we've got both our Netcat server and client working in Rust. Let's jump back and try and get the main function sorted out so that we can run the program as either rather than having to run it as one or the other. This is the main function we're starting with. So at the moment it knows how to behave like a command line application, which can either connect to a remote address or serve at a local address. And I've just stripped out the code that was here that was behaving like a simple server and client from previous videos. And now we're gonna make it call the functions we just built. So for the connect, we want to call our client function, wait for it to finish, and then unwrap any errors. We can't call await here 
because we're not inside an async function. So let's fix that. We'll make this a Tokyo main. And we'll make the main function async. So this is the same thing we did in the previous video. And then we can also call the server function here. And again, await it and unwrap any errors. And that should be it. We should now be able to run this program as either a client or a server by using command line options. Let's see if that's the case. Let's now try and do the same thing we did before, but this time we shouldn't need netcat. We should just be able to use rcat as both the server and the client. So let's try and start a server up first. So we'll cargo run serve on localhost on port 2323. These are going to be ignored, this localhost and port, but they're not optional for this command line application we're building. So we'll specify them here. Let's kick that off. And that says it's listening on 2323. Let's try and connect to it. Cargo run connect on localhost 2323. And it says we're connected. So let's try typing. So we'll send hello. That's turning up on the server. And we'll say hi back. And that's coming back to the client. So this is now completely working. The only problem we're going to have is if we try and do this anywhere other than Linux. So let's jump out of this Docker container I'm running here and see what happens if I try and run this on Windows. I'm going to try and do exactly the same thing again, which is to cargo run serve on localhost 2323. And that's up and listening. And then a cargo run connect on localhost 2323, which is connected. Can I send messages? Yes. And can I send messages back? Also yes. So this is mostly working, but if I try to shut the program down, it just crashes. And the same thing on the server, that should have shut down. Where the client's gone away, the network connection is closed, this should have shut down as well, but it hasn't. So let's jump into the code and talk about why. So there are two problems. The first one is that the client and server on Linux, they can just be launched and shut down and the signals that are sent by control C are handled correctly by the program. They just aren't on Windows and we need to do some work ourselves to handle that. So we need to update how we launch our server and client here. The other problem is this reference we create to stand it in. So in our Linux environment, when we shut the program down, standard in closes, Tokyo sees that and shuts down. On Windows, that reference stays alive. So we're still connected to standard in, we're still listening for data. As soon as we send something and Tokyo gets a chance to run, it will shut down. So if I typed into my server while we were running that demo that didn't shut down properly, it would have shut down. But that's no good, that's not how Netcat's supposed to behave. The way to fix this is to take control of the Tokyo runtime. Let's jump back to main and make a start there. Behind the scenes, this marker here for Tokyo main will set up a Tokyo runtime. So instead of relying on that, we're going to build one ourselves. So we'll mark main as not async and get rid of that and build a runtime. So we'll do Tokyo runtime. And there's a runtime type in there, which we can create a new instance of. Let's assign that to a variable. And then rather than doing async tasks here, we can launch a job on Tokyo. So we'll do runtime block on and then we can pass that an async function which is our client so this is very similar to what Tokyo would do it's going to run our job at the top level we have to block our program if nothing's happening it doesn't make sense for the program to be running so we wait for our async function our awaitable function to do something let's do the same thing for the server So that has fixed partly main. We still aren't handling signals properly. So let's do that at the same time. So to handle signals, Tokyo has built in signal handlers and we'll do a similar trick to what we did with the read and write, which is to use a select. So we're gonna select on either our client task or we're gonna to listen to Tokyo signals Control C. So we're effectively saying race these two features. One is our client function that connects to a remote server and sends and receives data, and Control C. 
and whichever one finishes first, the other one gets cancelled. So if we run Control C, our client should get cancelled and get shut down. And if our client finishes naturally, then this Control C listener is just removed. We stop listening for that signal. So that's again, do the same thing for the server. Let's test that out and see if Control C behaves properly. So let's start up our server, which is listening, and then we'll start up our client. And let's try and press Control C. So I'm gonna press that now, and nothing happens. So let's just try pressing it again, see what happens. And we're back to this same problem, that we're getting a crash when we try and shut down. And the server's still alive, which we expected to have shut down by now. So it hasn't quite worked. Although last time we were able to shut down immediately when we press Control C. This time we could press it once and nothing bad happened and then pressing it again it crashed. So what's going on? Well this is where we get some debugging skills out and spend some time on this. But this is the problem that we haven't dealt with for standard in being held onto. So we are shutting the program down. We are stopping the client task. We're no longer connected. So we can prove that if we set up a server and set up the connect again, type something in, it's getting sent, but if I now press control C once and type something in, that doesn't get sent. We only sent the first bit of text. So hitting control C is now correctly shutting down our client task, but the program isn't exiting. So let's jump back to our code and fix that. So the trick to solving this problem is to just explicitly tell Tokyo when we're done. And this is why we set up a runtime rather than letting Tokyo control the program. So we're going to do runtime dot shutdown on a timeout and we'll give it a duration of zero. So we're just gonna say shut down immediately. We don't really care about waiting around for this, we just want it to shut down. So let's see if it behaves like we expect now. Let's do the same thing again, where we start up a server and connect to it with our client make sure we can send some data through, which we can. And now I'm gonna press Control C just the once and our client shuts down. But even better, our server's shut down. So it's noticed the remote network connection going away. There's no longer anything to read from on the network. So that future finishes, the select block causes the other future to get canceled and our server function returns. So this is great. This is now behaving as it should do but on Windows, which is something that Netcat doesn't actually do. Netcat only runs in a Linux environment because it's so specific to Linux. So although we had to make some adjustments to our main function to make this work, we've now got a cross-platform implementation of the core of Netcat. We've been pretty code heavy this time, and there's been a few new things to think about, like dealing with Tokyo's net package, and also learning about select and how that works. And we've even had to worry about Tokyo's runtime rather than just being able to create an async main function. I definitely encourage you to give this stuff a try, particularly select and running futures and jobs with Tokyo. It takes a bit of time to get the hang of it, but it's a very powerful and useful tool to have in your toolbox. And we've also managed at this point to build the real heart of Netcat. We've got data streaming in and out, and we can shut it down. We can connect to original Netcat. There's lots more to add, but this is the really important core part of Netcat that we've managed to build now. And even better, it's cross-platform. Can't stress that enough. It's really difficult building this kind of stuff in C in a way that's gonna be cross-platform. Whereas using higher level libraries, yes, we're a bit inefficient. We're doing more work than we have to in terms of how much memory and how much CPU time we take up. But because it's Rust, it's minimal. And we can now run this on Windows, which is really cool. So I hope you enjoyed this video and come back next time to continue adding pieces to Netcat and seeing what we can do with it.